Thank you for listening to Emmanuel Baptist Church's podcast. For more information about the church, please visit our website at www.emmanuelmanning.com. Thanks and enjoy the sermon. And what I want us to look at tonight together is 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 10 to 21. 1 Peter 1, verses 10 to 21. I've got it up here on the screen, uh, but it would be good for you to uh, have that out so that you can look at it as we make our way through uh, the text tonight. So follow along as I read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 21. Peter's been talking about the salvation in Christ, and he says this, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout uh, the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I spent some time today on a website called therichest.com, and it was talking about... um, garage sale and uh, Salvation Army fines that turned out to be worth a whole lot more than uh, they were originally thought to be worth. There was an unemployed artist named Beth Feedback, and she had nothing else to do one day in 2012 except to wander around a local Goodwill. You may wonder what this is. This was a a piece of art she bought at the local Goodwill. Uh, She got it for $9.99. At the time, she had another artist friend who said, you should really look up the works of uh, Ila Balatowski. Maybe that's Polish. She looked it up, and the results shocked her. Apparently, this was an original painting uh, from this artist, and it was worth $34,000, if you are into that sort of thing. Uh, Here you see uh, the Goodwill, $5.99, Uh, And this is a a watch, somebody named Zach Norris, who's a treasure hunter, walking through a Goodwill in Phoenix, came across a 1959 Jaeger watch. He paid $5.99 for it. Uh, He ended up selling it for $35,000. I know, right? How about this? Now, some of you know this name, Lombardi. Uh, So this was picked up at a Goodwill in Asheville, North Carolina in 2014. Uh, It was a sweater, an old West Point sweater that uh, someone paid 58 cents for. Uh, But as it turns out, it was Vince Lombardi's West Point uh, sweater, and they sold it for $43,000. And then here's some junk. It's actually not junk at all. A Philadelphia woman was shopping in a flea market. She came across this, and it just caught her eye. Uh, she had a friend who said she should look into it, uh, and it turns out that it was a, a necklace from the 1940s. Check this out. Worth uh, $267,000. I know. Al- Alexander Calder, jewelry. You know who that is? If you're a craftsman, you should know. All right, who knows what this is? 
That's the Declaration of Independence. In 1991, an unidentified man pulled $4 out of his wallet for an old picture with a wooden frame during a flea market trip in Pennsylvania. After examining the purchase, he found a document hidden behind the picture. It was an 1820s copy of the Declaration of Independence that eventually sold for $2.4 million. And then finally, anybody have any idea what this is? Yeah, it's a Fabergé egg. That's exactly right. Uh, A scrap metal dealer found it and paid $14,000 because he knew at this flea market that it was gold and he was going to melt it down for scrap. Uh, Turns out he got it valued and it sold for over $30 million uh, at an auction. There's only 50 of these Fabergé eggs uh, in existence, and only 43 are accounted for now. Only 42, I think, up until the point he found that. Sometimes you have something that you don't know what it's worth until you stop and think about it, or you examine it, or you talk to other people about it. Uh, and what I wanted to do tonight, using this First Peter passage, as I look at it, is talk about why your salvation in Christ is so valuable. It's something that you have that very often we don't treasure nearly enough. Uh, And it's understandable. One of the hardest things in life and one of the habits that we need to develop most is day in and day out figuring a way to again be just moved by the gospel. Because if you're not on some sort of regular basis moved by the gospel, it just becomes rote, and we forget uh, how little, how much value it has. It just becomes another thing in our life, just another small piece of our identity. Uh, and Peter, in the passage tonight, uh, just takes our eyes and he focuses them on salvation, and he focuses them on why salvation is so valuable. So we got the gasp. You know, when I said that guy paid $14,000 for a Fabergé egg, you thought, well, what kind of deal could he have gotten? Then when it was worth $30 million, as I was thinking about this morning, I thought about just what Jesus said, that the kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field, right? A man discovers a treasure buried in the field, and for joy at his find, he goes and he sells everything that he has that he might get this field. Jesus himself believes that the gospel is a treasure. And we all kind of gasped when we heard $30 million, right? Uh, May God make it so that every single one of us would gasp again and again and again when we realize the value and the treasure, what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross. So why is salvation so valuable? Well, I'm a schmuck. I'm not going to do enough justice with it tonight myself, am I? I don't value it nearly enough either, but I want to just talk through a few points as to why the gospel is so valuable. First of all, the gospel is valuable because it saves us from ignorant futility. What do I mean by that? Listen to what Peter says in verse 13 and following. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers." You weren't ransomed with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Oh, boy, we could just stop there. It's valuable because what you've been ransomed by, right? Not silver or gold, but the precious blood of Christ. The Bible says that before God awakened us to the gospel, we were ignorant. And the Bible talks a few times about ignorance. Uh, Ephesians 4.18 The the Gentiles are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. And that's Paul talking about these pagan Gentiles 
But Paul also and Peter used that word to describe uh, Jewish folks at that time. Acts 3.17, Peter says, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your own rulers. So this wasn't an ignorance that there is a God because the Jews were ignorant in their own way. This wasn't just some sort of ignorance of the Ten Commandments. What they're ignorant of and what the gospel brings uh, is that is the glory of Jesus. This is, this, is the, this is the thing we have to get. The, the gospel isn't a change of mind about certain facts. It's not that you once didn't believe that Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, and sort of now you do. The gospel is, is, is more than that because there are a lot of people who know those things to be true and yet still reside in ignorance. Why? Because the thing that separates someone who's born again from someone who's not is not that they believe certain facts, but that they've been won over by the glory of the gospel. It's not just that you see the gospel is true, it's that you see the gospel is glorious. And that's the ignorance. The Jewish folks would have had the gospel preached to them for thousands of years. Paul is saying, you didn't realize the glory of Jesus. That's why you were dwelling in ignorance. He wasn't the center of everything. It's not just that they didn't know something. They didn't know the glory of Christ, and therefore they didn't see the glory of Christ in everything. Follow me here for a second. There's a lot of things that you may know about the world. You may know how trees work. You may know how soil works. You may know the stars. You may know clouds. You may know microorganisms. You may know all kinds of things. But the Bible says that this world was made by Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. The Bible says that Jesus is the arche, the founding principle of all of creation. And so here's what that means. Until we understand how something relates to Jesus, we don't fundamentally understand it. Because everything was made by Jesus and everything was made for Jesus. And I'm not saying we're here and I'm not casting any shade on anybody because I'm not there myself. But until we can see the glory of God through math, we don't understand it. Until we see the glory of God uh, in the way language works, we, we don't understand it. Until we see the beauty of Christ in creation, because the Bible says that everything was made by him and for him, and he is the foundational point of all things. This is why kids and adults, it's so important that we continue to grow and to learn throughout our lives. Because you may memorize the multiplication tables, but until you can see the way it logically relates and even how the mind of God is reflected in it, you've not fundamentally come to understand what's most important about it. Until you understand how things relate to Jesus, you don't fundamentally understand them. And what Peter is saying here is you used to live in this kind of ignorance. You didn't know, listen, you didn't, you used to not know that everything was about Jesus. And that at a certain point, God in his grace opened up your eyes to the glory of Christ. And goodness gracious, I don't know all the ways that the Lord works through math, but I'm in small little ways, I'm working on it, trying to get better with it. I don't understand the ways that God reveals himself through so many things, but I just kind of chip at it and keep at it until I grow and I learn and I learn and I learn because it's not like when we got through with college, we got through learning. We're trying to bury into those subjects until we can see how they reflect and reveal the glory of God and the face of Christ because everything is about Jesus, isn't it? And so why is the gospel valuable? Well, because God has opened up your eyes to the glory of Christ and hopefully God has given you a nose for Jesus in everything. Does that make sense? And then, Paul, y'all with me? Then Paul says, because you were ignorant, your life was what? Futile. Anybody know what futile means? It means worthless. That means of, of no real value. I, I read a lot of like self-help books. You're like, you're a pastor. Should you read a self-help? They're helpful. I, I learn little tips about how to hack life, right? So I can do more with my time. And sort of the impulse behind all of these kinds of books is your life's got to be worth something. You got to do something with your life. 
But what Peter is saying here is that when God opened our eyes to the glory of Christ, he opened up our eyes to the fact that anything that wasn't done fundamentally for the glory of Christ was what? <laughs> Futile. It has no value. Paul uses this word uh, in the New Testament a couple of times. He says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If Jesus is not raised from the dead, everything we're doing right here is worthless. It's worthless. There is no, well, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, then I've still lived a wonderful life and this gospel that's not true has had all kinds of good. No, it's worthless, Paul says. Worthless. If Jesus isn't raised from the dead, Paul says, be a frat boy. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die if Jesus isn't raised from the dead. Paul says, arguing over genealogies and controversies and dissensions and quarrels about the law are unprofitable and worthless in Titus. And James says this, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless, futile. A couple of weeks ago, we saw, uh, we were down in Savannah. They have a port in Savannah. We saw one of those huge ships come through with all the containers, you know, stacked like 16 high, 16 wide. I couldn't get my mind across how big the boat was that was like 200 yards away from me. And I just, I thought, thought this to myself and I said it out loud to my kids. All of that weight, all of that size is guided by a rudder. That's small. James says, your tongue is like that. So no matter how you think you live or what you claim, if there's no control over this thing, your religion is what? Futile. But the Bible says that because our, our hearts have been awakened to the glory of Christ and the gospel, the, the Bible says that our uh, lives are no longer futile. If it, listen to me. Anything you do for Jesus... Uh, redounds to eternity. So you can do all, you can hike uh, Europe and you can, you know, I I read today about a man who tried to get through Europe and Asia by the time he turned 40 because he wanted to hike all these things and see all these things. That's great. That's not the kind of stuff that Jesus is going to speak before God. The kind of stuff that Jesus is going to speak before God that will echo forever throughout eternity is when I was uh, in prison, you fed me. And when I didn't have clothes, you gave me clothes. And when I didn't, this, I did. These are the kind of things that Jesus is going to just shout out before God with your name attached to it. In other words, we lived as if he was the Lord. No matter how small our life is, right? If we just live it in his service, it's not futile. And that's a gift that the gospel has given you. The gospel has given you this gift that you're no longer ignorant and the things that you do are no longer futile, no matter how small they are. So remember, you in the back, you got a lot of life ahead of you, a lot of dreams. And you in the front, you got a lot of life ahead of you and a lot of dreams. Don't make them so big that they're not guided by the gospel. Because you'll die, and then you'll be resurrected, and that's when I plan to hike Europe and Asia. On the new heavens and new earth, that's when I plan to get that done. In the meantime, I'm just going to be, as best I can by God's grace, a, a relatively unknown pastor in a small church in Manning to the best of my ability. And I'll I'll catch the rest of that stuff in another life. And I'm not saying that this is second place to that. I'm just saying my priorities, right? Why is salvation so valuable? Not only does it um, teach you about the glory of Jesus, salvation prepares you for glory. What do I mean? Listen to what Peter says. Set your hope fully on what? On the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. Listen to me what Peter says. Peter says, you have an ability to set where your hope is. Our hopes are not just sort of like benign things that grow that we can't control. Peter says that you have the ability to take your hope and set it somewhere. That's a, and he says that it's the kind of thing that is sort of like it requires mental um, energy. It requires sober mindedness. In other words, there's a thousand promises in this world, and their job is to make your mind drunk, right? Now, I don't mean to pick on people, but 
Um, like my kids, my sons especially, one of my sons in particular, and they're not here so I can talk about them all I want, uh, spends his days thinking about ways to get the next piece of equipment in Fortnite. Now, I don't mind my son playing Fortnite. That's fine, right? If I minded it, he wouldn't do it. But I begin to have issues when I think that's the only hope. If, if his life's vision is no further out than I can't wait till I get this skin in Fortnite, and some of y'all don't even know what that is, and that's great. Um, you know, I need V-Bucks so I can do that. Am I, am I landing punches back there, kiddos? If your hopes are no bigger than that, then they're, they're very small. And, the bi- and, and so what do we do? Well, we daydream about um, our ship coming in, right? Or we daydream about uh, more energy or more health. Or we daydream about uh, more opportunities for employment. Or we daydream about a bigger... Or we daydream about all kinds of stuff. If you'll just have the mental awareness to realize that this world is giving you like hope liquor all the time trying to make your mind drunk. And Peter says, you have to be sober-minded and you have to set your hope fully on the grace. I just love what he says here. Set your hope is a command, right? Isn't it? That means there's an action that you need to do. Some of us think that if we're just not carried along by the Spirit in the right direction, something might be wrong. I don't know. I don't think the Spirit kind of carries me along. I think the Spirit empowers me and directs me to set my hope and to do a lot of things. But what Peter says here is you need to set your hope fully. That's an adverb, right? So to what degree are you to set your hope? Fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What? What is this grace that's going to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ? Well, Paul says this about it. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We get it backwards when, when, when terrible things happen. When terrible things happen, we tend to look at those as if they're thick, and we look at our Christianity as if it's thin. And what Paul did, because he had set his hope fully on the grace of Jesus Christ, when he looked at the suffering of the present time, he saw it as thin compared to the thickness of what is going to be revealed to us. There's a lot of stinking suffering in this world, isn't there? There's, there's mess happening with this storm. It's the third strongest one to land in the United States. There's uh, all of the terrible things that happened and were revealed in the Me Too movement and then... Uh, how it's been weaponized, and, and I believe all men, I believe all, like, there's just, and all of that has to do with the fact that there are just awful things that happen in this world, right? Um, I, I've said this before, but like, um, when all that Judge Kavanaugh stuff happened, I called my sister immediately, because my sister, uh, from the time she was two to the time she was four, was sexually molested by uh, a babysitter. To this day, if you grab her around the wrist, she'll go ballistic, and then when she was twice in high school, she was sexually assaulted, shoved in a bathroom. So I, and I'm not holding that forward as if that's my experience. I'm, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just trying to say I've had, it's, it's terrible. I know the kind of effects that it can have on people. And, and it is audacious and downright cruel if what Paul is saying is not true here because he says this that the sufferings of the present time aren't worth comparing. So what we have to train our minds to do is we have to train our minds to realize that there's a deeper reality than just what I can see. And this was hinted at in the, the gospel, wasn't it? Because in the gospel, you had Jesus crucified, suffering all kinds of suffering, And yet he was raised from the dead with a glory that has changed the world. That should give you a little foretaste of what God is going to do one of these days. We've all been, to one degree or another, through something terrible. Uh, We probably haven't been through anything near what the Apostle Paul uh, has. And he says that everything that he has suffered is not even worth comparing with the glory. And so the question is, goodness gracious, this life is terrible. 
And so how good must that be? John says this, beloved, we're, we're God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. So apparently, Jesus is so glorious that the moment that when he returns, you see him, he's so glorious that it's going to change you. It's going to evaporate sin out of you. And in a second, his glory is going to be so full that you just switch and you immediately look like him. You will either immediately turn into a reflection of the glory of Christ or you will be laid low like a leaf burning in a fire. Jesus' glory is such that in a minute, it just changes everything. Uh, Paul says in Philippians, by the same power that caused him to raise uh, Jesus from the dead, God in a blink is going to change. And so what happens is, why is the gospel valuable? The gospel is valuable because the minute Jesus appears, you will be screaming in victory and not in horror. And in a second, you will not be like a leaf that has been burned. You will be like a star in the heavens. And because his glory has the power to do that. Salvation is valuable because it prepares us for glory. Salvation is valuable because it makes God our father. Peter says this, we're to do all of this, not as slaves, but as obedient children. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In other words, I don't want to harp on this because I've already preached on it, but don't get drunk on the world's juice, y'all. It's it's ignorance. If it's not pointing you to the glory of Christ, it's not pointing you in the right direction. Don't be conformed to the passions, but he says, as obedient children. So it's not God yelling down at me, hey, you slave, get out of your ignorance. It is, son, son, come on. You know better than that. You know what's valuable now. As obedient children, do not be conformed. And listen, being God's child, we have to sit and stew in the gospel until that's fundamental to our identity. And this is a point I make a lot, but I want you to see what happened in Paul's life when he became a believer. This is Paul talking about his former life, all right? If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. This sounds a whole lot like the mental list that I have in my head to make me feel better when things don't go my way. Y'all have that list, right? Uh, this sounds like Paul's list. Now, I just want, so, so this was central to Paul's identity uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. That means as opposed to most Jews at the time, he spoke Hebrew and not just Aramaic and Greek. Uh, as to the law of Pharisee, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. So this was the center of his identity. I have achieved, I am in God's people. That's Philippians 3. Now look what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 19. This is where Paul says, I'm all things to all people that I might win some. Listen to what he says here. For although I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. Listen to this. To the Jews, I became a what? (laughs) You understand what he's saying there? If if in order to win people to Jesus, he has to start acting Jewish so they're not offended, that means that Paul normally doesn't act what? I just want you to let that soak in. His whole identity was built around the fact that he was a righteous Jew. And after Jesus came, his whole identity had been so shifted that now when he's around Jewish people so as not to offend them, he acts like a Jew. What, what, What am I trying to say there? Because this is a point that if you don't contemplate it, if you don't think about it, you don't get it. When Paul became a Christian, something fundamental happened to the way he thought about himself. All of the categories that he used to use, he no longer uses. And now he just uses free man, no longer a slave, son of God. Now, why would I harp on this point? Why is salvation so valuable? Because it makes God our father. Because here's the thing. 
Like I was praying for someone in our church not too long ago, and I don't want to pretend like I'm too charismatic or that I'm a prayer warrior. Uh, I just bring all my good stuff forward to make you think that, right? No. Uh, I was praying for someone in the church recently, and here's what the Lord said. He he, he, drew, really pray for this person because there's something that's holding them back in their minds, and they need to know that they're free of it. And I happen to know what this person had growing up in terms of parents, and they were terrible. And it just seems when I look at this person that he, she, uh, is just weighted down still by the words of long dead parents. And so when I pray for them, because I pray, I pray for you. I pray through our church's directory for you, right? Sometimes I'll let you know when I have. And sometimes the Lord just kind of says, this is specifically what I want you to pray. And so I went up to that person and I said, I was praying for you. And here's what the Lord said, that you have something holding you back and you need to let it go. And all of us have. There's, there's something in our lives that we identify ourselves by. And for most of us, unfortunately, it's something that happened to us. Or it's something that was said to us. Or it's something that we did. And so I want you to contemplate this not small point. That from the moment you became a Christian, the fundamental way you need to conceive of yourself now is a free child of God. And the problem is, we, we just respond instantaneously to what we think we used to be. Well, this is what I am. This is my identity. I said this a couple of weeks ago, and I still think that this is a true point. The biggest problem in our society uh, is not that there's homosexuals in it. The biggest problem in our society is that most of us now uh, identify ourselves by who we're sexually attracted to or that we don't experience sexual attraction. And as Christians, what we kind of need to be doing with people who have like a Christian worldview is saying, we can work on who you're sexually attracted to, but the biggest problem is that that's what you think identifies you. How lame is that, right? We don't, we don't, so Paul, whose whole, y'all get my point? His whole identity was, I'm these things. And now his whole identity is free, free man child of God. What, what you respond out of and how you respond kind of says what you are. And the great thing about the gospel, what makes it so valuable is, is it makes God our father. One final point. I probably could have extend, ex, like extended this list out, but this is one that stuck out to me. Why is salvation so valuable? It was and is highly valued by the righteous. Now, what do I mean by that? Concerning this salvation, the prophets prophesied about the grace that was to be yours. What did they do? So we're going through Ezekiel most of the time on Wednesday night. We've looked at Isaiah before, Jeremiah, who was stuck down in a prison, Malachi. The Bible says that these men... Uh, and there were women prophets as well, right? The beginning of Luke, uh, that they, when they prophesied, they, they searched and inquired carefully about what? About the grace that was to be yours. So there's, they had grace, but there's a sense in which we had a depth of a knowledge of grace because of Jesus. And the prophets, how many of y'all are on the Sistine Chapel? Right? Those guys, they searched uh, and inquired how. Carefully, never look past the adverbs. They searched and inquired carefully about the grace that was to be yours. Question, how are we doing about searching and inquiring carefully about the grace that is ours? Again, inquiring. And then it says, It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit. So we have those who preach the good news. That's the apostle by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then check this out. Things into which I had a friend in college uh, named Brian. He lived down the hall from me. He was a, a very quiet, 
very thoughtful, very godly person. And I just remember my freshman year of college, I was in Bible college, but I was, um, I was kind of a, a, a nerdy theological point scorer. You know what I mean? Uh, and I just looked like an absolutely ridiculous fool next to him because he was humble and the power of a humble life lived behind his words usually made the things that I said look pretty stupid. And so pretty early on, uh, I learned that I needed to be more like Brian because Brian was more like Jesus than me. And so I listened to what he said. We had lots of conversations, uh, and he had a real impact on me just by his humble and gracious way of dealing with people. He came out of terrible circumstances and was humble and grateful. I just remember wanting to be more like Brian because Brian was really holy. And then there have been other people in my life, like my father-in-law. I just want to be more like him in many respects because there's a, a weight and an authority and a power to the things that he says because he, he lives it out. And I only say that to say this. Uh, one of the reasons that the, the gospel is precious is because you have a better knowledge of it than the prophets and, you, and angels long to look into what you can look into. And so let's close just by saying this. Um, our whole model of ministry here at Emmanuel is built around the fact that the gospel is powerful enough if we'll just engage it and let it be. That's our whole model of ministry. It, and so if we'll just be people of the word and people of prayer, then, then we'll see amazing things happen. So it's not about do we have the best of this, do we have the best of that, because we never, like, we never will, y'all. We, we just won't. And the thing is, that's fine, isn't it? That's fine because the power resides somewhere else. Uh, and so what we need to do on a day-in and day-out basis is just spend our days realizing that what we thought was just some gold we could melt down was a $30 million egg. And this old jacket that we spent 58 cents on is actually worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. That the gospel that you, listen to me, that you possess, the gospel that you have, you have it is valuable beyond all you can imagine. And so we need to spend our days digging down into it and praying, Lord, open up its glory more before my eyes. Help it to, to tell me who I am more and more and more. Help me to be moved by it. Lord, help me to look at it in the way that the angels do, to long to look into it, like the prophets, to search diligently in it, to be moved in it every day, to remember uh, what kind of gift we have. Uh, I've told you this before. This is a repeat sermon. I only have like eight stories. I didn't think I'd make it here 10 years, but lo and behold, here we are. Uh, in my office, maybe I shouldn't broadcast this because I don't want anybody to break in. I'll move it tonight. Uh, in my office, as somebody was asking me about it today, is my grandfather's 1945 Martin Triple Aught 28. Uh, I, somewhere I have buried where my grandmother paid $150 in installments from Rice Music House so that my granddad would have it when he came back from war. Uh, and I remember when I was a kid, my cousin and I used to think it was funny to take it and pretend like we were smashing guitars like Eddie Van Halen. Luckily, we didn't do any damage to it. Uh, but I got it repaired and got it repaired again. And um, right now it's worth about $18,000. Um, but, but I don't think about that. Well, yeah, I do think about that, right? Somebody got really sick. I needed to hawk something. That would be first to go. Forgive me, granddad. Um, <laughs> but how do I treat that when I pick it up and play it? Because I do. It's an instrument. It has to be played. It gets crappy if it doesn't get played, right? They have to be played. Uh, how do I treat it? Very carefully. Who do I let hold it? Oh, I let people hold it. I just tell them it's worth 18 grand before they mess with it, right? Um, but that's the point, is that we have, we, you, you who think you may not have much, you have a possession that is invaluable. 
And, and the same sort of uh, peace of mind that having something like that gives me, having something like the gospel should give you. So let's diligently look into it. Let's carefully inquire. Let's daily look at it and pray that the Lord would keep our hearts soft to it. Let's pray.